It's your man, DJ Seiko Vaughn, back again with another episode of the Fly Guy Podcast with my dude, the Crumb Snatcher. What's up, good brethren? Peace, brother. Peace, brother. How are you? Feeling excellent. Feeling excellent. And we're honored today to have the irritated genie on with us on the Fly Guy Podcast. How you doing, bro? I'm doing fantastic. Honored to be here. All right. And I, actually, I'm doing you a disservice because... Your title, your name and title is actually the Irritated Genie of Southeast. Southeast. Oh, it's Southeast? Yeah, Southeast. You know, we say the DC, we say Southeast. <laughs> I was like, it's Sufese or Sufisi. I was like, I'm going to have to learn what, you know, what he's taught. It's from the Southeast. Southeast DC, yeah, that's what you <laughs> Okay. That's what's up. That's what's up. That's what's up. Well, look, man, um, I'm learning about you. Tell me about War on the Horizon. I was looking at your website. I'm going to pull it up in a second. But tell me about a War on the Horizon. Okay. In 2009, uh, from, two, from, from 1994 to 2009, I was in an organization called Positive Comedic Visions. And it was a strong organization. Uh, I think, I think the, let's see if I can remember this thing. It was, Positive Comedic Visions is an African-centered, community-based organization committed to the total self-determination and empowerment of Black people throughout the world. Basically, it was an organization designed, uh, started by everyday brothers, some strong brother, brother by the name of Mr. Black Unifier, who was a super strong warrior out of Washington, D.C. area. And these are just Black men saying, we have problems in the Black community, and we need to work together as Black men to provide some leadership and direction and protection for our, our community and do something about the ills that face our community. And one of the things that we were really passionate about, one of the things that attracted me to the group, one, they was all strong brothers, but two, uh, from the age of 15, I had a young sister tell me she had been sexually abused. My, one of my best friends, I was in a private school in Massachusetts, only a few black people. So she and I became very good friends. It was nothing, you know, nothing intimate or anything, but like, she was like my best friend. We were really close, she was a Jamaican sister. And she told me about her experience being sexually abused. And at 15 years old, that thing just resonated with me. And it opened up something in me that began to, uh, as I began to uh, just live my life, all these women started coming to me, black women, and telling me it had happened to them. I had no idea we had this kind of epidemic going on. I had no clue that people did this stuff. So at any rate, uh, that's why when I met brothers and they were saying they got a problem with these guys putting hands on children and it was a real problem. I was like, none of the other brothers I talked to know about this. So I was attracted to that. And then they were warriors. And I, you know, I didn't grow up with a father in my home. So, uh, you know, I was attracted to that as aspect as well, to learn manhood and to be around some strong brothers and, and to try to do something about what's happening to our women and just those kind of things and fighting racism. But at any rate, I was there until 2009, ended up deciding to leave and start my own organization. And what I did, I felt like we were in a crisis situation. And I said, you know what? I'm going to come out and I'm going to say things. Because I've seen since the death of Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad, peace be upon him. Ooh, his, peace be unto him. Yes. <laughs> since his transition, I had noticed that the rhetoric outside of PKV was kind of, it was just a weakness in black men. It, it, it was, everything was soft and watered down. Everybody was weak and scared and cowardly. Nobody would say what they meant and mean what they said. Nobody would stand on a strong position. Nobody punched somebody in the mouth if they got too far to the line. It's just no manhood. And so I said, you know what? I really, and this is true when I say this. I said, I'm not going to live through the end of this year. I said, but I'm going to go out here and say what needs to be said so that black people know. They, nobody will ever say, hey, we, we got wiped off this planet. We didn't know what was coming. I said, I'm going to tell people what they're really facing. I'm going to do it unabashedly, unashamedly unafraid to say it. I'm going to say it exactly like it needs to be said. And I'm going to say it without apology. And I went out in 2009 and I did it. And, um, I, you know, what happened was I started spreading the message and, and talking in, in my best rendition of a black man who's saying we're in a state of emergency and it's warfare. Different groups around the planet are committing genocide against our people. We got to do something. And the words of Millie Fuller struck me after about a year of me doing it. And I was still alive. He said that when the racists, you said they're very mature in racism and white supremacy as a system. 
He said there was a time when you would say something, they would jump out there. But what would happen if they did something to you, they would create a martyr, and then more people would begin to emulate you. And before long, they were fighting an idea, which is much more difficult to kill than a person. That's right. He said, what the racists do, they listen to you. You can say whatever you want to say. Then they go outside and see if anything's changed. If something's changing, then they come to address you. If nothing's changing, everything's staying the same, then they let you blow, uh, blow into the wind. So what I realized. Whoa. I just got to let that marinate for a second, man. Yo, salute, uh, salute Neely Fuller, bro. Man. <laughs> wow. You know, okay. All right. Continue. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> let me just be honest. I'm in D.C., so I studied. When I say study, they didn't know me, but I went to their seminars and just, I mean, I really read their books and studied under Dr. Francois Wells and Dr. Neely Fuller as, as a young person. Um, just going and seeing them and really studying the things that they were saying. And that's how I can bring this up. Nobody told me this. I learned it from him. Then once I applied it, went out and said these things and it didn't happen, I said, well, I know what that answer is. I figured it out because Baba Nelly Fuller told me. A uh, long time ago, he told all of us. So yeah, and sometimes you apply it. So Warner Horizon was started as a war horn, literally saying, no holes barred. We're going to, no, I'm going to tell you even more specifically. I sat down with a group. It wasn't just me. There were some brothers I had talked to and said, look, I want to start an organization, and this is what I want to do. Right now, everything is weak. I said, what I want to do is create something that's the far right of everything that exists and thereby pull everything this direction. So what we consider to be strong now, once I finish, will be moderate at best. Right. <laughs> what, we, what we consider moderate today will be an Uncle Tom. Right. And then an Uncle Tom that we have today won't even be able to speak by the time I'm done. I want to create something to death bar that it pulls everything to the right. And I actually feel like, you know, and I've talked to people when I, who I talked to about it and said, do you think we've done it? And in the last three or four years, we've come to the conclusion We've done it. We've seen a shift between the dialogue we were getting in 2009 and the, the sophistication and understanding what we're facing with the different things that are happening to black people, knowing what to focus on and what not to focus on, knowing what's a problem and what's not, knowing how to articulate our issues with things. We've seen a sophistication and a hardness and a strength that we would like to say on some level that we participated in or contributed to that we think is partly a result of our decision to create what we call War on the Horizon, which was designed to inform black people, the war horn saying, we're in a lot of trouble, here's what's happening, here's what we gotta do. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Can I add value to that? Um, I remember growing up, um, there was a, 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 it's famous now, it's an interview between Method, uh, with Method Man and uh, Old Dirty Bastard, and Old Dirty pa Bastard spoke on the small hats. And um, uh, Method Man, he was like, no, I don't have any issue with the small hats, the small hats or whatever, and this and this and that. And Method Man came off really sheepish. He came off, you know, tail tucked between his legs. He came off like a porch monkey. He do anything for a dollar. Don't rock the boat. Very coolish by all standards. And you know, um, uh, at that particular time, it it was ODB, rest in peace, who uh, was able to take a stand. Just like he said, you know, uh, uh, um, at, at one point in time, if you said something, they come for you. Uh, now, you know, they're a little more uh, moderate with it, you know, because uh, uh, they don't want any martyrs. And you know, when he was saying that, when the God irritated genie was saying that, I was thinking back to where, when I saw those things happen. And you know, Method Man was a popular guy, so we kind of accepted that coolishness as a standard, don't rock the boat, let it be. Versus now, you know, with the whole Gucci thing, you know, we've had a slew of the so-called leaders. I, I'm not starstruck by, um, by celebrity saviors by any degree, but we're seeing in that form where they're speaking up and you know, that, that coolish behavior that we saw uh, in, in the early to mid 90s that was prevalent is now ca you know, uh, uh, dying away. And we're seeing the emergence of, of, of more strong melanated men who are taking a stand just as the brother has said. And you know, bear with me, I'd, I'd say even you know, uh, till this day with the tone that we have, Irritated Genie has been a part of that to set that in place. If war is on the horizon, what do we need to do? 
I'm so glad you asked that question because if you see behind me, we have the banner. This is our Straight Black Pride banner. You see Dr. Wilson on the banner. It says self-respect is the foundation of justice. That's the thing she used to teach. And it's interesting that you said that. Um, when I first started, like, and I'm being very serious, I thought that I would not live 365 days from the time I started War on the Horizon. War on the Horizon was to say, here's the problem. Once you know what the problem is and you've dissected it, then you have to try to find solutions. I lived long enough, <laughs> that was 2009, uh, it's 2019 now. By 2014, I started to realize, okay, I'm going to live through this because I have to actually produce something that actually says, okay, you know the problem. Whites are like, okay, that's fine. You know the problem and? So I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I got the next part of the problem. Now we know what the problems are. We're facing extermination. Now I had to really dig in the crates of time and say, okay, we're facing an international problem and a crisis for the extermination of our people, the destruction of black families and the destruction of a race of people around the world, in the Caribbean, in America, uh, in the Asia, in um, Europe, that little corner of Asia uh, called Europe, in the African continent, even in Australia. And I said, we're facing an international crisis. Where do I look? to find solution-oriented ideas of what to do. Well, one thing I looked at was once we realized the problem, this was something that is a negative thing, but it actually works in our favor. What they are doing now, because the world is a lot smaller than it used to be because we have planes, trains, and automobiles, and we also have internet. That means that right now, for the first time in the history of the world, we never had it like this. We're right in this real time. I can talk to, if they choose to tune in, I could be talking to a billion black people on this planet right now. That technology and capacity has never existed, which means the distance between me, you, and our brothers and sisters in Canada, in Europe, on the African continent, there is no distance in this electronic virtual world. We're literally real time, if we can find one another and tune in, real time, we're right next to each other. Okay, okay. What that allows is for the European to have the same orchestrated destruction mechanisms for black people everywhere. Because now that the world is so small, that what they do to us here, it is not difficult for them to pick up and go somewhere else to do it. They can do a lot of it virtually. They can give us electronic, psychological food, media for destruction of our people, and they can put it in one place and we all get it at the same time. They don't have to fly and take resources to different places and do it. They can destroy us everywhere at the same time. So oh, snap. You know what? I've all often heard about because of the internet, we're able to connect and share information, but I had never heard anyone speak about the ability of others to inflict harm of us in a mass situation because of the internet. And, 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 and you, know, you see, you, you, we get, we talking right on the same page because this is the thing I saw what, cause I was traveling around to the African continent. And what I was seeing is the same thing they're doing to us in the U S now they're starting to do it here on the continent. And I just got back from South Africa, you know, Zania uh, this October, we got back in November. And what I see is they actually have accelerated their worst condition than we are here in terms of what they've done to our brothers and sisters in Zania. But my point being, I start saying, wow, this is no longer a national formula that you go to each nation and see how they're attacking us. They now have a formula. It's the same formula that they use with minor adjustments here or there that might not even be that relevant most times of how they're killing black people around the world. But you just said the key component. Well, okay. They're killing us in the same way, which means what? It's easier for us to relate now for two reasons. One, because we now have a media, a mechanism where we can talk to all our people at the same time, but guess what? We now don't have to figure out how to relate to a brother or sister in Jamaica. 
I don't have to figure out how to relate to a brother or sister in Kenya. I don't have to figure out those nuances because the same war that they're putting on us here and that they've effectively used us as 50 million guinea pigs to demonstrate how they can destroy black family and black culture, they used us as the guinea pigs, they're now spreading around the world. So we can talk about the negative depictions of black women in, in videos the depiction of black men as not being responsible and how it will destroy the morality, uh, the promotion of homophilia and sexual abuse and homosexuality and how it destroys communities. We've gone through it. When I talk about it now to the international black community, it's relevant to them. The brother and sister in Ghana says, yes, I see what you're talking about. They're trying to force this on our nation. We don't have to go through a process now that the world is smaller and now that they're doing the same thing to all of us everywhere. We literally can talk about what has been done to us. And here's the beauty of it, if you're a black person from America. This is the whole beauty of the whole thing. Because we were the guinea pigs, the ones of us, like us three that are on the line and people who, a lot of people who are tuned in, who on some level have made it through, we're still alive, we're still thriving, and we're still black men that love black women. Right. And sisters that listen to still black women that love black men and want to have black families and want to do something good for our people. So to that degree, we've made it through this destructive system. We now have the best experience of understanding how these mechanisms and war is waged against our people. So what we're able to do is, and I do it all the time, when I go to the African continent, when I go to Europe, when I'm speaking to brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, I explain to them how this war is waged. And as I begin to start talking, they'll tell me, okay, well, these three things have already happened here. I said, okay, this is the next thing that's gonna happen. You know, I can talk to them because we already been through it. So we have such a, ben black people in America are potentially the greatest benefit. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. The conscious, responsible, African-centered black people, heterosexual, straight black and proud black people who love black men, black women, and black families and still believe in that and are working to keep that going are some of the best resources for our brothers and sisters around the world because we can tell them the damage that drug use is going to do to their community. Mm. We can tell them the damage that hip-hop or this uh, licentious culture is going to have on their community. We can tell them the damage that interracial dating and all. We can explain to them all of these things, homosexuality, pedophilia. We can break down, you're going to go from this to this. Let us show you. We can even show them now with the tools that we have, like what we're doing now. Here's where we were in the 1970s. Here's where we were in the 80s. They brought this, here's where we are today. You don't want to be here. So here's how we can help you. To, and just showing them that part will help them go, wow, we know where we're headed. And then we can help them figure out how to prevent it. And so um, we have tools. You say, how do we prevent it? We actually do what we're doing now. We share relevant information. We use the tools that are available. We show videos. We, we, we go to books that our brothers and sisters may not have the time to read, and we get the parts of the books that would benefit them and show them the information and give them the timeline of how this has happened, why we're in the condition, and then we start showing them other brothers and sisters in the history of our people who fought and got out of conditions, and then we put a program together now. So last part I want to say, because it really goes to your question. After doing the War on the Horizon, seeing the problem, and looking at the smallness of the world, what I said is, we need a platform like Brother Garvey. Father Marcus yeah. Garvey, we realize this. If we put all our differences aside and recognize that we're black, and that's what brings us together, black mothers, black fathers, black lives, black past, and a black present, and a black future, we can ignite our people to stand up and do something. But what we did is we recognized he had the right platform. However, we're not in 1918, we're in 2018. And what we realize is in the condition we are in today, we had to make a slight adjustment in that platform. We don't want to say, and I mean, I have to be honest, we have to put 
uh, 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 criteria on which black people we want. But we got to make it simple because we okay. want to save our people. But it's not sufficient to say black people, let's come together and do something. Why is it not sufficient? Because if you say that, what you will end up with is pedophiles, lesbians, homosexuals, people that will prey on our children and destroy it, rapists, interracial dating black men that want to come in and bring white females and, and, and various other females that are not black, black women who do the same thing. We have to say we understand the war that's been waged against our people. So now in 2019, we're going to say, up you mighty race, but you got these are your criteria to be part of this black family. You got to be straight. That means a consenting man with a consenting woman. We don't want rapists, we don't want pedophiles, we don't want homosexuals, we don't want lesbians. You gotta make a decision to, to govern your behavior in a manner that's acceptable to be part of this family. You gotta be black, black mother and a black father. And why do we do that? Because the black women said, every time we invest so much uh, resources in you brothers, what happens is when you finally make it, you turn away from us and you go get a woman that don't look like us, and it's too hurtful. Let's incentivize. So my answer to that when we said we were start, let's create a platform that incentivizes black men to be with black women and black women to be with black men. And it's probably the only thing that you get from birth that's a, that you get as a benefit for being born black is that you can be part of a movement that no one else can. It's called a straight black pride movement. And the last thing we said that encompasses our economics, our sense of self-respect, our morality is pride. If we don't have dignity, who cares if we're straight and we're black? If we're gonna curse each other, walk around with our pants hanging off our behinds, if we're gonna be brutalizing and mistreating each other, calling each other out of our names, inward this, and our women are, you know, the fact, we gotta have a sense of pride and dignity. We gotta spend our money with each other, help each other grow and develop. We gotta properly educate each other and look out for each other. We created a platform that we said will be easy to be attractive to black people anywhere in the world. We don't care what your religion is. We don't care what your, as long as you ain't no devil worshiper, none of that satanic stuff. Um, we don't care your religion, how much money you make, what education you have. If you're straight, you understand that we don't tolerate that kind of foolishness in this environment. If you're black, you got a black mother and a black father, and you got some self-esteem and pride, or even if you don't have it, if you're willing to develop some self-esteem and pride and love for our people, let's work together to better our condition. Man, you took on some very uh, stringent and politically incorrect positions there. <laughs> yes, sir. You must, you, I, I can't imagine the amount of backlash you might get. You know, cause, uh, if, if I listen to what you're saying, then I have to throw out some of our greats. I have to throw out Baldwin. I got to throw out Nikki Giovanni. So when, when, when you say that, are you losing some of the people who could be beneficial to our struggle and eventual success? I would have been very much of that mindset in the past until I did research. I did a book. It's called War on the Horizon, Black Resistance to the Homophile Assault. It's on my website. If you go to the store uh, on the website, you go there, you'll see the book in the store. Uh, under the book section, War on the Horizon, Black Resistance to the Homophile Assault. And I did the research for the book in 2003 and wrote it and then released it by 2005 after it was edited. And this is what I found. I have chapters in it that talks about some of the people that we lord uh, and have great tremendous respect for historically that were involved in this behavior. And let's just use James Baldwin to represent more than just the one person, but let's use him to represent the homosexuals. This is the interesting thing you find when we start looking at the political homosexuals historically who are presented to us as great people who helped us. Almost invariably, all the ones I've studied have been strongly engaged in the destruction of our community, even though they are lorded and presented as people who are doing benefit to our community. Let's use James Baldwin for an example. Please, please, please. Okay. 
So James Baldwin's career, how did he even get off the ground? He was, uh, he, he, he was seen by uh, Richard Wright, who was in France at the time. Richard Wright invited him out there and said, man, this guy is brilliant. He loved what he was doing. Richard Wright used all of his influence to help James Baldwin get notoriety. And so he was working to help James Baldwin. And what James Baldwin did was he saw an opportunity to try to get favor by the whites by doing something you would never expect someone to do in this situation. So what he did, he wrote a scathing criticism of, uh, I don't know if it was Black Boy or Native Son, one of Richard Wright's books. And in, in the literary environment in the field, it's like one of the things, I mean, it was just, it was, it was horrible for the fact that he had worked with him. But he wrote this scathing criticism of the very person that was trying to help him. And when he did that, of course, the Europeans were like, wow, we like this guy. And he was able to get invited back to the United States of America because he had gained notoriety because he attacked, he, he had attacked the great author, uh, Richard Wright. So the very person that put him on the attack, that's not all he did. Hmm. He comes back to the U.S., yeah. So he comes back to the U.S. and then starts, you know, he writes these black books, supposed to be pro-black and all this stuff. But one thing he did, and you talk to anybody that reads his books, he would always throw these homosexual things in the middle of these great novels. How he, some guy was attracted to some other guy. And you're like, well, where is this coming from? And of course, for our young people that are reading it, they don't know that he's a homophile. So they're just reading it and it's just hitting them like, where is this going? So that's one thing he did. But nobody talks about the book he wrote. I believe it's called Little Man. But he wrote a book about a grown male uh, getting in love um, with uh, a young boy. So he's actually promoting pedophilia in his literature. Whoa. Yeah, but it goes further. Let me, let, me, let me take it further. Let me be more specific because some people will say, well, that's how you interpret that. Let me be very clear. <clears throat> In the 60s, it was such a turbulent time because black people, uh, you know, the whole black power movement, we had become very aggressive in seeking, yeah, little man, that's what it's called, uh, in seeking our own self-respect uh, to be counted, to be taken seriously, even to develop our own direction. And so what did we do? We started using one of our great ancestors as the uh, epitome of manhood and warriorhood as an impetus for us to gain strength and courage to go out and fight against police brutality and all kinds of oppression in the society. So we began to re- vitalized the memory of the prophet Nat Turner. That meant a lot because when black men looked and learned about Nat Turner, it made us feel like we don't have to be afraid. If Nat Turner could do that, we can go fight for our freedom. What did James Baldwin do? This is probably the most wicked thing he did that really would probably really help people understand how sick the homophile tend to be. Nat Turner, when he was alive, he wrote a confession. It's a, uh, like a 10-page confession. It was uh, right. recorded by a, uh, an attorney, uh, uh, Thomas Gray. So he got Nat Turner to tell the story, why did you do what you do? And right. like, a real, like a real warrior, Nat Turner said, this is why I did what I did. He never apologized for it. And then when he asked, do you regret it? He said, did, did not Jesus die to do the right thing for it, to save his people? So he, he, he fashioned himself as a prophet doing the right thing on behalf of his people. He was an inspiration for our people. What James Baldwin did was he encouraged William Styron, who was a homophile himself, homosexual himself, to write the novel that he was writing, to give it the same name as the real confession of Nat Turner, which was called The Confessions of Nat Turner to write a fictitious novel. And James Baldwin suggested to Styron, make him a homosexual. He said, well, why would we do that? He said, because if we're trying to intercept the black revolutionary spirit, if you give the people this revolutionary and he's a heterosexual, 
then the men will become more masculine and more revolutionary. But if you make him a homosexual, either of two things will happen. He will cease to be an inspiration for black people or brothers will read it and assume, well, Nat Turner was homosexual, so maybe it's a revolutionary thing to be homosexual. Mm. They won't know that this is a novel written by a white guy, and they may actually get into homosexuality based on their reverence for Nat Turner. So while he's in there spending the summer with his lover, these are two boyfriends, uh, James Baldwin and William Styron, while they're there doing their thing sexually, He's encouraging William Styron to sodomize the legacy of one of the greatest warriors, one of the bravest men in the history of our people in this country, Nat Turner. These are the kinds of things. This, I mean, I'm not telling you everything. I mean, in the book, you know, I give a much more detailed account of a lot of the treason he was involved in. But what happens is what whites do is that they have a habit, and we've studied this, the homophiles in our community, in our race, uh, uh, A. Philip Randolph, we call him Gay Philip Randolph because he was a homosexual. Um, Beard Rustin, who was his boyfriend. Uh, we, um, James Baldwin and so many others. Nikki Giovanni, these individuals, most of whom have been uh, involved in very direct and open treason to our people. When the whites write about them, they write about them as heroes of black people. They give them forms so that they, uh, we get access to them and we actually believe these people are fighting in our interests when in fact their real interest is to pull our people into this sick psychopathic misbehavior. <laughs> you come with receipts. Uh, um. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, that's one thing like, I can show you better than I can tell you. <laughs> the backlash just had to be some backlash. Just has to sound like hate speech. There have to be people that are saying that you're uh, creating an atmosphere where people are going to get hurt. Uh, that's an atmosphere where people are not being valued. If I can add value, we are already in an atmosphere where people are getting hurt. We are already in an atmosphere where people are not valued. We are already in an atmosphere where we are second class citizens and these people are marginalizing us as a people. I would even argue that Irritated Genie is doing the uh, exact opposite, where he's, he's, he's in support of an environment where our people feel free to stand up for who they are. If I could just, just back Irritated Genie up for just two seconds, because people said the same thing about Crumb. They said, Crumb, you know, what you're doing sounds so mean, it sounds so harsh, it sounds so bad, you know, but um, uh, I have the audacity the audacity to be black. And I think that's what a brother was saying at the very beginning of the show. You know, because we got Trump out here. Trump will say anything and get co-signed. That woman who was battling with Trump and Trump sent those people to kill her, she said, if you come for me, you better shoot straight. Hmm. We got these people in this country who will say things to get us killed. And we don't got one black man to stand up. Every time one of us stand up, he's scared for his life. Yeah, they will kill us. That's absolutely uh, 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 obvious at this point. But the question is now, in the face of such ad adversity, who amongst us is still willing to stand, is still willing to speak? And I think uh, I personally have to give kudos to the brother for having the audacity to stand for his people in a time like this, in an environment like this, where they will open. KKK don't even wear hoods no more. Are you following me? They can't make you don't even wear hoods no more. In an environment, let's talk about that. In an environment where the KKK don't wear hoods and you got the irritated genie, follow me, family. I'm let sorry. Me, okay, I'm okay, okay, uh, okay. I appreciate that, but I want, I want to really answer your question directly. And thank you, brother, for that endorsement. I appreciate the support. It means a lot. Just so people can understand, because I don't want people to think that when you do this, you're not going to face things. So let me just say a few of the things that we face. The day we put the first flyer about black family and launching the straight black pride movement on Facebook. And I, I've kept this just to remind myself because it's so interesting. You know, I've been doing War on Horizon for some years and I told people, hey, we do the straight black pride movement. This is going to be taken easier. And my people told me, Tina, you, have, you don't know what you're talking about. I was like, no, nah, who's going to be afraid or upset with straight black pride movement? My people were right. 
When we launched the Straight Black Pride Movement, we put a flyer on Facebook saying we're having a family event to launch the Straight Black Pride Movement. Within an hour, we had Angela Davis saying, what in the world are they talking about? This is crazy. We got to do something about it. We had people saying, whoever's doing this should be burned alive. We came under the kind of assault. I had no idea the kind of hatred that would come out when black men and women come out and say we want to promote black, straight black proud families. It was, it was an incredible backlash, but that's just the beginning. Then a month later, I go to Bermuda and do the same lecture I've been doing for God knows how long, since 1997. And the white government in Bermuda, after I do the lecture, uh, Feminization of Black Male, and I talk about the, this agenda being pushed on our people. I didn't know when I got to Bermuda that <laughs> on that Monday they were having a, a, a meeting to try to get people to be convinced to vote in gay marriage. When the people of Bermuda, it was, it was it was an auditorium full of people, it was a movie theater. When they heard the lecture and saw what was going on, they flipped. They said, everything you're saying is happening right here in Bermuda now. We're not going to let this happen. And the people end up two years later voting them out because of it. But what they did, literally, I left there on Monday. On Tuesday, I got notified that I had a five-year ban that I was banned from entering Bermuda. So I was banned from entering Bermuda because, and they specifically said it, it, I was banned because I said that a black man should only ban a black woman. And then I said black people should only spend our money, that we should support one another financially and spend our money with each other and help develop black businesses. And they actually said that these things that I said were hate-filled and I actually got accused by the Human Rights Commission there in Bermuda of a human rights violation because I said that black men should only marry black women and raise families and we should support each other financially. So that's a five year ban there. Additionally, every account I've had with PayPal, uh, like two years ago, I think it was, every account, I mean, we talk about different accounts for different things. In one week, all of them were shut down. I mean, there was nothing that happened, they were just shut down. And basically the excuse they gave or the, 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 the reason they gave was we can't support anything that supports hatred to any protected class or groups, blah, blah. Basically, we, you don't agree with homosexuality. We're not going to let you, uh, you know, do commerce. And of course, PayPal is owned by a homophile. So that made sense. Very recently, Square. You know, we were using Square. We the pay, PayPal, hey, Square is even better anyway. Let's get Square. Very recently, just out of the blue, Square sends a notification. Uh, you, you, you violated term three and four of our, uh, our, 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 our condition, terms and conditions. Now go read those, what are three and four? Basically, if you don't agree with homosexuality, we're getting rid of you. I mean, they, of course, they classify with different language, but that's basically, you don't agree with the homosexual agenda, pedophilia, homosexuality. You don't agree with this stuff, you can't do commerce. So these are just a few things. I mean, I mean I, okay, I was making $115,000. You know, I was doing I was doing what you call moonlight. During the day, I was working as a small business specialist uh, at the department. I mean, uh, uh, immigration, uh, immigration ICE, immigration customs enforcement, which is a division under DHS. I work. I live in Washington D.C., so I was I was making one hundred fifteen thousand. I was having a ball, you know, because I'm making my money by day, coming out here teaching my people by night. Uh, I, I got fired. And I've got put all over CNN. But it's his moonlighting videos on the internet that are attracting attention. The liberal-leaning Southern Poverty Law Center says Mr. Kamathi is the individual known on internet web videos as the irritated genie. All over MSNBC, I mean, just a total, this guy's a hate field, this and the other. So I lost my job. So, yes, you know, you do come under fire when you do this. But here's the good thing. If you don't come under fire then you're probably, it will, if you're doing what I'm doing, every, we don't want everybody to come under fire. But if our people are going and dealing with what we're dealing with, if you're really effective in doing something for our people, then you should be looking to see that person has come under fire. And that's kind of how you you can measure, is this person effective or not? Because we said, Millie Fuller said, they don't come after you until you're effective. Once you're effective, then they start pushing back. And I would say, to some degree, I would say, I hope some of those things that I'm sharing is saying we're having some kind of impact. All right. Should people, should black people consider supporting the Trump administration? 
I'm going to answer that, my opinion. Let me be clear what we're dealing with, because I don't want anybody to take this wrong. We're caught between the Ku Klux Klan and the cannibals. And I just want people to just imagine this for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> you got the Ku Klux Klan on one side. That's Trump and his, you know, his team. And I'm just saying the, what, 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 what white nationalism represents in the mind of black people. We're talking about the Klan. We, we understand the Klan. And on the other end, we have cannibals. Well, here's the reality of our situation. I don't know if we could actually make an intelligent argument which one we'd rather be under the wing of. Do we want to be under the, the wing of the Klan, who's going to hang us and kill us? Or do we want to be under people that's going to eat us for breakfast? I mean, like literally covers in pieces and eat us. I'm saying that to say this is what the, face, the situation we're facing. In this situation, this is what I would say. We're looking at our own interests. And since we see right now what is destroying the black family community internationally, the most effective tool that they're using is the homophilia. It's destroying our children in schools. It's destroying families. It's separating people. It's making families not be able to come together. It's ravaging our people internationally. Because cannibals are the ones, and I'll be talking about the Democratic Party now, who are doing that and promoting that internationally for the destruction of our race. And the Klan at this point, which we know are our enemies, it's happening to them too. So they're to some degree, not all the way, but to some degree they're resisting that particular imperative. I think what we have to do in this moment is say, well, you know what? We don't run as big a risk with our people falling in love with the Klan. Our people know the Klan. Our people understand the Klan. Our people are not gonna fall in love with the Klan. So if we were to support an agenda that they have that works in our interest, we don't have to worry about our people falling in love with them. We see something we agree on, we fight to get that, and then we're out of there because these are not our friends. But at least we know with the Klan what we're dealing with. You know, we have failed as a race of people politically. We have not understand the genocidal aims of the liberals and the Democrats. And because of it, we've been able to be manipulated and really have turned our community into just upside down and inside out while giving full loyalty to the Clintons, to the Obamas, individuals who hate us and demonstrate their hatred at every turn. So to the degree that there is an agenda that we want to push forward, that they, they meaning the, the, the Republicans and the Trumpers and the Libertarians or whatever, have an agreement, which, which is right now we're against the homophilia, homosexuality and pedophilia. I think that an alignment in that and in that alone would be healthy because it would release us from this uh, 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 over loyalty to these Democrat and liberals and let us start focusing on what we want and see whoever can give us that or help us get that and get that achieved. We work with them. There are no permanent alliances, only permanent interests. We work with mm. you on that and we get it done. And once we're done, we're gone because we know we can't trust you uh, around us any more than we can trust these guys. That's what I would say. Wow, wow. Now, we're going to have you here in the Hampton Roads area coming up very soon, February 24th. And you're going to be speaking on Mind Your Black Business. So I, to me, that seems like a, uh, a 180 <laughs> from your earlier talk, earlier, you know, dealing with, um, you know, sexuality and other things you've been talking about. So Mind Your Black Business. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you'll be talking about in that presentation. Yeah, and it's going to be, it's not going to be the full one, but we'll have the DVDs available so you can get the whole set. Basically, we're going to be talking about the importance of business. One of the things we don't know, or I'm not saying we don't know, but I don't think a lot of people understand the relationship to liberation, freedom, and business. All freedom movements that we have had that have been authentic freedom movements for black people have been funded by someone. There's never been just a bunch of poor people who just did something to lift themselves out of their bad social condition without money. It's never worked that way. There's always been some businessman or businesswoman 
who's making money in industry, who says, hey, you all want to do something to help our people? You want to start schools? You want to start a movement for us to get rights? I'm going to put the money up doing the business that I'm doing and fund the efforts that you're doing. Lots of time it came from the local businesses or national businesses, people who were making money in industry and said, hey, I'm not just making money. I love my people. I'll help if someone has a legitimate plan that I think could work that can help our people. And so our liberation is tied directly to our ability to produce and profit off our own production and use some of those profits to fund efforts to better our condition. And so I'm gonna be talking about the relationship with the importance of business, what it does for the self-esteem of black people when we're in business for ourselves, what it does for our sense of self-worth and do-it-yourselfism, if you can use that as a word, you know, where we say, we don't have to ask for someone to feed us or to make houses for us or to do plumbing for us or to clothe us. We actually will develop the skills, create the products, and produce these things for ourselves, our own narrative, our own direction. And none of it can be done without understanding how important it is for us to be in business. And I'll be honest, this is one of my, my failures and it's taken me a long, long time to realize it. And it's just now in life that I'm really beginning to get better at it. I was so concerned about the social aspect. I was making $115,000 a year. I take that money, I dump it into this movement to teach my people, blah, blah, blah. But what I wasn't as successful in doing is saying, well, look, that's great. But look, one day they might say, you got to go. They're not going to feed you anymore to help you fight, fight for your liberation. <laughs> They're going to stop feeding the pony, you know, the gravy train. And so I didn't say, how do I get involved in commerce with my own people or not? But, but mostly with my own people, what I want to do, because I'm p black people oriented. How do I do it where I'm making money for myself? working with other black entrepreneurs and figuring out how to feed myself, feed my family and use that funding as part of the process of what we say in straight black pride of funding our own liberation. And I'm at the point now where I'm in that part of the process. I'm doing that work. I'm seeing my value. I'm doing things more as a businessman. Everything was free before. You can call me up and say, come on down here. You know, I, I, there was a time. I ain't doing it now. So let me be clear, everybody. Not doing it now. But uh, I, as I well know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Brother Seagull, you can say, if I don't know nothing else, I can tell you the irritating genie telling you the truth on that. It ain't me. <laughs> but, but I had to realize, if, 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 if I can go and trade my labor for the Europeans and do a great job working for them, and then come out and work for my people 10 times as much commitment for what I give to my people than what I give them, then it's okay for me to charge my people to get what is very valuable that I have that's for them. They should want to pay for it because it has value. And if they pay for it, I can do it better. And then I can live decent. And young people can look at me and say, I want to be like that. And if they see me with a decent car, and they see me with some nice clothes and they can say, hey, I can do something that's valuable for my own people and I can make a living too. I don't have to starve. I don't have to be weak. I don't have to go without medical care. I can actually make it and be working for my own people and be working for myself and all of these things can work together. And I'm gonna be talking about, you know, how do we take ourselves from the condition we're in today? We're, I think 99% or over 90% of our people work for whites the ones that are working. How do we change that to maybe 50% of us work for black companies or work for black people or work for ourselves and the other 50% work for them? Why do I want still 50% working for them? Because as a military man, and I'm not military trained from the US military, but I'm military trained in terms of racial survival. Anywhere that there's money, anywhere that something's going on, I want my people there. Anywhere that, that, that things are happening and decisions are made, I want my people there because I want to know what's going on. I want somebody with any skill 
that exists out here because if I need those skills, I want to come and be able to get them for my people. So I not only want to see black people working together and doing our own thing in infrastructure with business, but I want us in their businesses, in their infrastructure, in their military, and their everything else as well, so that they can't surprise us with nothing because we know what's going on because we're in there. Is everything, you know, in terms of economics and with sexuality, is it truly the war that you describe it to be? It absolutely is. And Mac, I'm going to say this, and a lot of people don't realize this, but if you talk to any black people that start to go from being rich to wealthy in business, they will universally agree with this when I say it. If business ain't nothing else, it's warfare. Like, even more than the sexuality, which is definitely warfare, it is what I'm saying that it is, but if you really want to talk about warfare, you're talking about business, and I'm going to tell you why. If, I, if you don't get nothing else from this discussion, take this with you, brothers and sisters. You cannot permanently oppress any group that can finance its liberation. I'm going to say it again. Woo! You can, you can oppress anyone if you're stronger than them militarily. You can do that. But you cannot permanently oppress any group that doesn't want to be oppressed if it can finance its revolution. Why? They'll simply pay people to fight. It's just, it ain't nothing complex to it. And fighting isn't just taking a gun. Fighting is thinking, fighting is money, fighting is infrastructure, fighting is politics, fighting is speaking. There are lots of different ways to fight, but the bottom line is this. If you got money, you can pay somebody to fight. It's just, it's just that simple. You can convince them that they need to fight and you can say, here, take that with you before you leave. And they'll be smiling all the way to the bank. If you can prevent a people from having the economic means to finance themselves, you don't have to worry about what they can do. The only thing they can do is talk. So if nothing else is warfare, I'm not talking about the mom and pop shop, but once you get past the mom and pop shop to really start developing and tapping into wealth, they are coming. And if you black, you better know it and you better have a plan in place. No group the Asians, the Europeans, the Arabs, no group on this planet sits idly by watching black people develop wealth and use it to control our resources and our future and doesn't intercede and try to prevent it. Because none of them benefit, no race on this planet benefits when black people are economically self-sufficient. Okay, okay, Kamala Harris. And I'm just kind of going through some of the videos I see on your YouTube channel, and I'm just kind of getting some bits and pieces of thoughts sure. on these topics. Kamala Harris. All right. And some of us call her Kabbalah Harris because, you know, she's married to the small hat. So um, <laughs> you know, the Kabbalah <laughs> is a reason. Okay. okay. For those of us who were uh, neophytes in that thought, what's the small hat? Big hat. What what are you referring to? <laughs> the small hat. Uh, we call the white so-called Jews, the Zionists. We call them small hats. Uh, so we talk about Zionism, uh, so-called Jews, the Ashkenazis. People use many different terms to describe them. We talk about really the folks that really run the world, the puppeteers of the world. Um, what we'll say about Kamala Harris is she's one of the most dangerous individuals ever before us. I can't say anyone is more dangerous than Barack Obama, but I'll say this, she's at least as dangerous. Maybe even more, I don't know if you can be more dangerous than him, what he, the devastation he committed against black people internationally, but Kamala Harris, okay, her record in San Francisco as district attorney was absolutely horrible in terms of hiding and defending all the information about crooked cops who were destroying the black community unfairly and unjustly arresting and, and, and terrorizing the black community. She defended them and protected her even when forced, I mean, authorized and instructed by judges. I mean, literally white judges, I think. I think the judges were white. You have to investigate these killings of black men and these people. You have to do this. She refused to do it and, and, and ducked the responsibility and defended crooked officers that she knew was crooked. 
you go past that and beyond that, you know, the people were saying, you know, for nonviolent offenses, you know, this whole three strikes you're out that the Clintons did has destroyed the black family. We right. So many black men in prison. So we said we need to get early releases for nonviolent offenders. Kabbalah Harris, absolutely not. She said no. She was 100% against it and refused to do it. And here's where we see her being perfectly targeted against the interests of black people politically, like where it's just to the point where it's like, it's no way we can defend. All of these things are indefensible. But this was horrible. When they were trying to determine whether or not they would have gay marriage, a lot of the people in California said, we don't want this gay marriage stuff coming here to California. And they proposed something called Proposition 8 and said, let the people of California democratically vote to determine whether or not we want marriage to be between just a man and a woman or if we want anybody to be able to get married. And Proposition 8 said, hey, we only want man and a woman. Here's the incredible thing. Whites, pretty much 50-50. Hispanics, 50-50. Asians, 50-50. Nobody knew that a man was supposed to be the woman. I was so proud of our people in California. 70% of the black people voted and said, marriage is between a man and a woman. We saved Proposition 8. California had voted in. Essentially, homosexual marriage was illegal. Marriage is defined by God and by the state as man and woman. But what happened is the California Supreme Court said, we don't care what you voted democratically. We want to overturn it. She, was, she had become, at this time, the attorney general for the state of California. So now she has an even more prominent position. So what she was supposed to do since the Supreme Court of California overruled the people's Democratic vote, and it was really the black people's democratic vote because all the other groups were 50-50. We were literally the only group that made a definitive decision to say proposition it should be it. So she really was not going against the people of California. She was going against the black people's vote of California. Her job was to now take the case from the California Supreme Court to the federal Supreme Court on behalf of black people who say marriage is a godly institution between a man and a woman. She said, I'm not taking it and would not take it. And told the people to go get married, men and men and women and women. She's not going to represent the interests of black people in that state or black people period. So she fought against black men with the mass incarceration. She fought against in, in protection of police brutality. She, 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 she fought against black women uh, who are Come on, who votes more, black men or women? We know more of our sisters were voting than the men. Uh, yeah. And our sister said, marriage is between a man and a woman. She said, I don't care nothing about none of you black folks. And she went in there. So what we have to understand, she is a serious proponent of homophilia. She's married to a small hat, a white so-called Jew. So she hates black men. She's not married to a black man doesn't care about the black community, doesn't care about black women, doesn't care about black children, doesn't care about a black future. She has no respect for us as a people. And it would be insane for us to fall for the same trick we fell for under Obama in supporting this insane female who hates us. Rise of the mulattoes. <laughs> Uh, before we get into that really quickly, I just want to put out there for the uh, for the record, I am not mulatto. My mother and my father. <laughs> <laughs> he said, let me put a note out here, buddy. <laughs> Go ahead and get your DJ envy on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, say, Look, I'm a light-skinned brother. I am a brother. <laughs> I'm a brother. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, the rise of the mulattoes. Um, years ago, I read a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization. I encourage every black person out there to get this book, The Destruction of Black Civilization. Uh, in my opinion, it's the foundational book for any black person that wants to work on behalf of black people. There's no more important a book. And one of the things that he points out, this is not a matter of opinion. He studied 6,500 years of history of our people. Okay. 
but it's not my opinion. This is what I learned from Dr. Chancellor Williams. Peace be upon him. Peace be upon him. I think he's my favorite historian, actually. My favorite historian. I love him. I love him. Okay. He says, um, he says, the greatest enemy, the greatest tool, the greatest, uh, how did he say it? I I'm paraphrasing. Uh, the group that was, that had the greatest responsibility, the greatest assistant to the destruction of black civilization, two whites were the mulattoes. The number one support system for the destruction of black civilization, who supported the Arabs, who supported the whites, uh, who supported the Asiatics, no one was more supportive of the undermining and destruction of black civilization than the mulatto class. Now, he makes the point that it's not 100% of mulattoes, and he says even some mulattoes in, throughout history were even more loyalty, uh, loyal to our race than even our, our own brothers and sisters. But he makes the point as a class, historically, as a reality, the mulattoes have been a bitter vicious enemy to black people. And for, for clarification, let me clarify this because the brother made a good point. People misunderstand what the term mulatto means because we haven't used it for so many years. It has nothing to do with your complexion. You can be my complexion to be a mulatto. It has 0% to do with complexion. Correct. A mulatto is someone that has a white parent and a black parent. If one of your parents is not white, you're not a mulatto. That's not, it doesn't, it, or, or, a, or an Arab parent and a black parent. It, it, it has to do with your parenting. It has nothing to do with your complexion. So for people that's life can go on, here we go with this colorism. You, you're misunderstanding the term mulatto. It means some black man laid with a white female or some black woman laid with a white male and produced a child. And those children of those mixed, we're not talking about slavery, even though we had issues after slavery, but um, during the course of history in the destruction and undermining of black civilization, the key groups that supported the white and Arab overthrow and decimation of black civilization have been mulattoes. That's important because if we understand how it happened in Kemet and how it happened in Haiti and how it happened in early the 1700s in America, our brother Edward Blyden, who was a powerful black nationalist, one of the things he was reported to have said is, the only thing I want you to put on my tombstone is he hated mulattoes. And he didn't say that out of some uh, egotism or issue he had with Juan Mulatto, he was looking at how, as a class, how they were undermining the development of black people, even in early America. So um, that's what we talk about there. When we see Barack Obama, we see the Lucius Septimius Severus of our time, the Roman general who attacked North Africa. That's what uh, Barack Obama was. I'm sorry? No, teach, brother, God dang. <laughs> yeah. You know, Lucius Septimius Severus was a Roman general Black folks in North Africa got very happy because he was half black, half white. First mulatto general that we thought was black. He became the most violent general, uh, leader of Rome in terms of his treatment of brothers and sisters in North Africa. And he was able to do that because we laid our guard down because he looked a little bit like us and we thought we were getting something good. That same trick was employed on our people with Barack Obama. Fortunately, we've learned something now, because I'm very proud. I'm looking at how people are dealing with Kamala Harris. Uh, she's not black. Now, I can't tell you exactly what she is. She's one of them funny folks. I don't know. She's, her mother's Indian from, from, from India, East India. She's not black, but she looks black. But she really is not black. I mean, she's an East Indian, if you know anything about Hinduism. Like, she's part of the caste. They have a caste system. And true African people are not even on the caste system, meaning they were calling it untouchables. Like, I can't even describe it. Like, we think we face racism in America. We don't understand racism. Like, what they face in India, on that, even on the caste system, the lower parts get mistreated. But the African people, like 100 million black people somewhere in India, the way they're treated, they're called the untouchables. Yeah, the Dalits. The, the Dalits. Indians? Oh, okay. And they're not, the Dalits, if I'm not mistaken, they're not even on the caste system. They, 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 which means they're <laughs> the caste system. And in the religion of Hindu religiously black people are our devils and an underclass race. So I'm saying that to say her mother is of that stock 
And her father is from Jamaica, but I don't know exactly what his racial characterization is. I'm not certain. But I'm saying that she's not black. That's what I can tell you. She doesn't have a black mother and a black father. All right. Black identity extremists. Okay, black identity extremists. Um, what, what I would say is I think that every black person should be a black identity extremist. I think <laughs> we should love our identity as Africans. We should know our identity and we should be extremely in love with it and be proud to wear You see me, I'm wearing an African shirt right here, right out of Ghana with African embroidery. We should be very proud of our identity. The fact that this term was created by the federal government to criminalize us, the black men and women who see our racial identity as being a key component in our survival is very telling because what it means is they have identified that in order to keep us enslaved, they must make us forget and lose our love for ourselves and our identity. Once they've done that, then they can deconstruct us. And the people that are preventing us from totally cracking and falling apart in the black community are the ones who are teaching people our proper African identity. Okay, okay. Kaepernick. <laughs> okay, Kaepernick is simply um, an extension of the Barack Obama, Lucius Septimius Severus uh, situation. Let me put it, uh, he's another magic mulatto who pops out of nowhere, but let me tell you the real backdrop of it. Let's remember, let's see if we can remember. We're going to take a little trip down memory lane. Let's go back to 2016. Remember, okay, there, there was a brother in, 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 in the NFL. They called him Beast Mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you remember. Okay, and this is what happened. We were having police shooting after police shooting after police shooting that was happening. We had Trayvon Martin in 2014, I think it was. We were having all of these murders. Uh, we had the sisters getting murdered. Uh, our sister, Rakia Boyd, up in Chicago. We were just having all of these murders. And it was getting to the point where it was getting out of hand. Uh, we had Mike Brown in 2014. I think it was 2014, Mike Brown. Um, and what was happening was a lot of tense, uh, people were getting intense. And we were looking for just something to get us riled up to make us, you know, pop. Because we were sick of getting murdered. The way, and it, it was all under Obama that it was happening. And he wasn't saying nothing about it. And what happened, if you remember, he was the number one running back in the league, Brother Beast Mode, uh, Marshawn Lynch. He started wearing red, black, and green medallions. Hmm. He started not talking to the media. Look, I had stopped watching sports altogether. I mean, I'm black people getting killed. I, didn't, I wouldn't even pay none of that stuff, no attention. But it was really deep. This is what they did. <clears throat> Anybody who saw that Super Bowl will remember. Right before the Super Bowl on Thursday, the Super Bowl was on Sunday. On Thursday, he said, I give a shout, shout out, out to, to all my, my real Africans. Africans. You all remember that? Yes. Okay. Here's the thing. The whites were very smart. They said, wait a minute. No black man in football or in any sports refers to black people as real, real Africans. Africans. This is not good. What was happening? Our people were angry about all these killings. And it appeared we were about to have a Muhammad Ali moment. It appeared we were about to have a Tommy Smith and John Carlos moment. So they had to say, what are we going to do? So they went to the Super Bowl, and Marshawn Lynch had made all of the plays necessary. He got to the one-yard line. And they were like, if this guy runs it in, he gets player of the game. He's going to be the one giving the interview. We have no idea what this guy is going to say. But on Thursday, he just said, shout out to all my real Africans. He's not getting the ball. They made a call. I'm sure they made a call. Somebody told him, we don't care what happens. He's not getting this ball because we don't know what he's about to say. I do not know the man, so I'm totally guessing. I think he was about to make a political statement being the player of the game he was in the right place at the right time. It was about to pop. They didn't give him the ball to end up throwing an interception. 
They lost the game, but they didn't have to deal with the fact of this man going up there and saying something that reverberated among black people and getting a true, authentic black champion. Why am I bringing that up? He was an authentic, homegrown black champion. Training young brothers in Oakland. Doing, I mean, he's a real black man. So what did they do? They said, we don't want someone else authentic to pop up. Let's create our own magic entertainer. They went out and got a homophile, a little funny, funny guy, who ain't black again because Obama had worked so well, they can run this on us. And they manufactured Kaepernick as this great powerhouse guy and our people just fell for it hook, line, and sinker. I told people when it happened, do not fall for this. You don't know who this guy is. When you start researching him, you got the transsexuals coming out talking about how he had a relationship with Kaepernick. The guy is with the homophile agenda. He starts going with the Black Lives Matter, which is really a gay movement, the Gay Lives Matter. It's all about promoting the homosexual agenda. That's the end goal. Stop falling into it. I told our people, but our people, we're looking for easy victory. So it just made so much sense to fall in love with this guy who all of a sudden is black. We don't even know if he has a black parent. We really don't even know what this one. But his hair looks like he might. So let's say he has a black father. Uh, he's, he all of a sudden is super pro-black. But this is how we know that was all a trick. I told people it was a trick. How do you know it's a trick? Because now all of a sudden, the guy who's supposed to be this great revolutionary gets a Nike deal for millions of dollars. Come on, brothers and sisters. John Carlos and Tommy Smith struggled the rest of their lives after the situation they made. Uh, Muhammad Ali, it took years for him to recover from being stripped of his title. You're not rewarded for being a true black revolutionary. That does not happen. Nope. This was a trick and we didn't see it as unfortunate. He's not one of us. He's not out there for us. We got to start learning how to discern who's real and who's not. Let's, let's kind of wrap up. Irritated genie. Why the irritated genie? The, the irritated genie <clears throat> is a book that was written about the Haitian Revolution by Jacob Carruthers. And in the book, oh. it's... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and w what it means... The Haitian people said, you know, how were they able to defeat the Spanish, the English, and the French and the greatest armies of the world with very limited resources? And they said it was the angry spirit of the African people, the, the irritated genie, that means angry spirit, to resist tyranny and oppression that was able to embody them so that they could take these hard positions and say, we will not be enslaved and we will run you out of this country. And once I read that book, I shared it with a lot of brothers I was with in PKB, and they said, bruh, that spirit they tell them all, that's you, bruh. <laughs> so you gave me that name, the irritating genie. Of course, because right, I'm yeah. Southeast DC, I added Southeast on it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 Brother, we're looking forward to having uh, you, and you're bringing Baba Astra Quazy back to Hampton Roads. The master teacher himself going to be live and direct. He's on first, too, so don't be there late, brothers and sisters. Two o'clock, get there on time because the master teacher is going to drop it, and you know that's my baba. You know, that's the baba, and I'm the student just trying to live in his shadow if I can, but he's going to bring the noise, and I'm going to drop a few jewels myself if I can. How did you hook up with Astro Quasi, bro? Because his message is a little different than yours. You know, I you know, and I actually – I do discuss spirituality because I have some lectures on that, but let me just be clear. If you got if you can hear me or Bob Quasi as it relates to spirituality, you better go with the master. That's the master right there, you know. But um, it's, it's a funny story. You remember when, when the first cell phones first came out and they were these big clunky things? I mean, they were like, yes. okay. I have a big clunky cell phone and, I, and uh, there was a sister out in Manassas, which is about an hour away from D.C. Right, right. And I talked to my mom. We used to hang out all the time. I said, Mom, the sister told me about this lecture, the African origins of Christianity or whatever. Uh, I'm going to go see it because I used to like this sister. Uh, she's an elder sister, and I like going to her events. So my, my mama said, yeah, I want to come. And i never forget. It was that Saturday. And you know, you're a young brother. I was in my 20s. You said you want to go out with mom that day. But, yeah, I was going around maybe trying to holler at you know, some sisters or whatever the case may be. So I was trying to duck mom. 
but I had my big clunky cell phone, so your mom called, you gotta pick up, right? Right. So mom called and said, <clears throat> babe, you said we was going to this thing, come on over. And I was like, well, you sure you wanna go? Come get me. <laughs> All right, mom. So we get there, <clears throat> and because I was so late, we, were, we missed the first half. Okay. And we came in the room, and my mother's sitting on the left. I still remember it was in the auditorium, like a school auditorium. My mom's sitting on the left, and I'm sitting on the right. We had never heard of the brother before. And I'm looking at this brother's talk. And we are both looking at, and we probably did this 30 times. We would look at each other and go, and then look back. And we would look at each other <laughs> like, because <"Hey." laughs> we, you know, we had seen Dr. Ben, we had, we, we had seen Dr. Wilson, uh, Dr. Nilly Fuller, we had seen Dr. Amos Wilson, but we never seen anything like this with the documentation and the visuals that Baba Kwesi gave. And our minds were blown. And I then told the brothers in PKB, let's go check them out. We, they came out, checked them out. Brother Chris said, I like this brother, he's a soldier. And we invited them to speak for our people. And from that time, we developed a relationship. I ended up going, I've been to Kemet with them seven times been uh, to Ethiopia with Baba Kwesi once and Uganda once. So we've been around the world together to some degree. And uh, that's been my Baba and he's, you know, taught me and I've tried to learn as much as I can from his, his incredible wisdom and the wisdom of his wife who, you know, taught me a lot about the liberation efforts by black women to make me really appreciate black women even more than I did before I met her. Wow, wow. Crumb snatch, I'm going to give you the uh, last crumb. <laughs> I um, I emulate my energy from the spirit of the irritated genie. You know, we know if we look at etym etymology, genie is short for genius. The irritated genius. You know, if I could give all honors, um, you know, these are the things that have really molded and shaped me to have that audacity to speak. With seeing brothers like my big brother, irritated genie, who came before me, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, we must adopt these spirits and these positions where, where, where we em embody the true spirit of our people. If we don't stand for something, we will fall for anything. And in 2019, uh, according to, to, to the Gregorian calendar, we've literally fallen for a little bit of everything. You know, um, if, if I can end it with a quote from my father, you can fool all the people some of the time. And you can fool some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. We are in the age of Aquarius, and for brothers like the irritated genius, <laughs> who, who has really motivated Crumb, this is the time of our great awakening, and I'm and I'm so proud, honored, and humbled to be a part of it. So uh, the last thing I want to <laughs> say is, stay fly, stay fly. Stay fly.